Um, our next uh, la last speaker for this uh, symposium is um, Antonio Lamantia. Um, and um, Anthony is a developmental biologist and he's the director of the um, Center for Neurobiology Research at Virginia Tech in uh, Roanoke. And um, Anthony's um, research focuses on defining and understanding the neural circuits that regulate specific uh, uh, human behaviors and linking these to complex brain disorders like autism and to multi-system disorders like 22 co one deletion syndrome. Anthony, off you go. Oh, uh, we don't hear you. No, hear I can read you. Now I can hear you. All right, you can hear me. All right, <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. And I wanna thank the organizers. I wanna thank Rachel for proving that academics like cats can be herded. And um, what I wanna tell you about today is I want to start with this observation that the puzzle of 22Q1 deletion syndrome is that there are so many genes and so many phenotypes and I think we've seen that and I think Raquel in particular addressed that. But to get around that and I think the key to solving the, <clears throat> the overall puzzle is to remember it's a developmental disorder. And so what I'm going to propose is that rather than mapping 22Q11 genes onto particular phenotypes, I'm going to map development onto 22Q11 deletion syndrome. And I want you to think about development as a series of steps, a stairway, if you will. And I want you to remember that it is a series of steps and also that taking each step involves many genes. And when the embryo starts to climb these stairs, um, and if it climbs in the right way, you get typical development. And we're going to look at this particularly for the brain and for the neural circuits that arise in the brain. And I want you to remember that neural circuit development, like everything else, is a multi-step process. And I'm going to look at three steps. I want to look at the initial patterning of the neural tube and the neurectoderm that's going to go on to make neural circuits by making neural nerve cells, which have to then proliferate. You have to make the right numbers in the right places and the right types. And finally, you have to build circuits from those neurons um, that will process information and generate behaviors. Now, if you have a little stumble at the first step of patterning and another stumble during proliferation and a final stumble in circuit formation, you will get divergent development. And even though you may be able to climb the stairs and not fall off, you will end up at a different place on the landing. And so that's what I want to argue is happening in 22Q11 deletion syndrome as we map the syndrome onto these developmental steps. And so we'll get started. The way that we're going to look at this is we're first going to think about some distinct behaviors that are targeted by 22Q11 deletion and their underlying circuits. Now, we're going to learn these in mice. These deficits that we're going to look at in mice are related to those in humans. But of course, mice don't get schizophrenia. Mice don't get autism. They may not even get 22Q11 deletion syndrome per se, but we can use them as a model. So the first behavior that we're going to look at is suckling, feeding, and swallowing because 22Q11 deleted individuals at birth and several neurodevelopmental disorders have a difficulty with this. They aspirate, which the mice do, shown here. They get lung and nasal sinus infections, which the mice do, um, caused by accumulations of milk in the bronchi or in the nasal sinus. And they don't grow, which in part can be attributed to a lack of proper feeding. And the circuitry for this is the circuitry that controls those pharyngeal muscles that Robert just told you about. It's the cranial nerve circuitry that arises from the hindbrain very early in development and gets this behavior set and ready to go at birth, which is necessary because if you don't do this, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, the second kind of behavior that we're gonna look at is a particular mouse cognitive behavior that involves the mouse learning a rule and then recognizing that it has to reverse what it's learned to do a new rule and get a reward. And it turns out that mice are not very good at this, uh, large deletion mice are not very good at this reversal. So this indicates that the circuits for this behavior are disrupted. And we know that the circuits for this behavior engage two association cortices in the mouse brain, like the association cortices that are thought to be targeted in 22Q 
in humans, but a lot simpler. And that these circuits are what are thought to be important for making this behavior happen. So what we're going to look at is how these developmental steps in the context of 22Q11 deletion, the orthologous deletion of the mice, the large deletion mouse, but we'll use, actually disrupts each of these steps. So we're going to start with patterning and a little stumble there. Does it really happen? We're going to look at two kinds of patterning. The first for the forebrain, which my lab def defined a long time ago, particularly in terms of retinoid signaling. And this patterning results in a very distinct distinction between the cortical rudiment, which is going to make the cerebral cortex, and the basal forebrain that's going to go on to make the basal ganglia, but also the inner neurons that migrate into the cortex. Retinoic acid is very important for patterning the ventral part. We're also going to look at hindbrain patterning. And again, retinoic acid comes up in this context because it posteriorizes the rhombomeres that will give rise to the posterior cranial nerves. And that's shown here in this nice pattern in rhombomere five and six of an RA-dependent gene CYP26B1. So what happens in the context of 22Q11 deletion? So we're using a retinoid reporter line that um, Elwood Linney and I characterized a long time ago. And what you can see is that it looks like the retinoid signaling in the large del ventral forebrain is diminished. And indeed, we can measure that quantitatively by dissecting the forebrain, measuring the LAC-C product. There's about a 15 to 20 percent decrease. And also, when we look at retinoid signaling enzymes, I'm showing you RAR beta here, they're also diminished in the forebrain. And if we take a section through that forebrain, it turns out that that ventral region that receives the retinoid signaling that's diminished in the large deletion is the source of inner neurons that migrate into the cortex. And in work that um, we've done previously, we've shown that if we just take those migrating inner neurons, their gene expression profile in the large deletion is very different in terms of the transcription factors they should be expressing in the place where they start, and also that their migration is different due to the di disruption um, in expression of CXCR4, which Pete mentioned earlier. This causes a delayed and disorganized interneuron migration into the cortex. It flips the frequency of interneurons, and it's mediated by CXCR4. Now, for the hindbrain, we have a slightly different story because here we're looking at retinoic acid, not in its absence, but in its excess. So what happens in the large deletion is, is that this normal posterior to anterior grade gradient becomes increased. And you actually get a posteriorization in the anterior rhombomeres that will make anterior cranial nerves um, of retinoid-mediated gene expression. Now, if we look at individual 22Q11 genes, we focused on the RANBP1 gene because we know it's retinoid regulated and we thought that it might make a contribution to this or at least show us that we were barking up the wrong right tree rather. And what we saw when we knocked this out homozygously is we get the same enhancement, but it's even more distinct. There is even a greater increase in the retinoid signaling anteriorly. So that led us to ask, well, can we rescue this by lowering retinoid signaling? So we bred in one copy of our LDH2, the knockout, which lowers retinoid production by about 35%. And you see that we return the patterning in the large Dell background to the wild type. We haven't posteriorized. Now, does this make any difference at all? Well, when we look at the trigeminal ganglion, we see that in a normal animal, it, it develops nicely. Its axons growing out are nice and fasciculated. Look at the same trigeminal ganglion in the large Dell. The fasciculation is disrupted. The uh, trigeminal doesn't develop as quickly or as, as large, and it's even worse in the RANBP1. Now, when we look at this rescue, we see that the rescue in the large Dell background returns the fasciculation and the growth of the trigeminal to normal, as if the patterning is really driving the next steps of development. Um, so I've shown you now that to start off with, we have divergence of patterning, both via retinoic acid, that may be having an impact on setting up the domains that have to go on to make the key parts of the neural circuits. So we're next going to look at proliferation and see if there's another stumble here. And so what we found is that in the trigeminal ganglion, as you're making the cells necessary from the placode progenitors, which are going to make mechanosensory cells labeled with 6-1 and the neural crest 
which are going to go label make nociceptive cells with uh, went one Cree, that there's a change in the distribution of these cells and indeed the proportions. And when we looked at this, it looked like the cell class distribution and neighbor relations are altered. And indeed we quantified that and they are. But more importantly, what we found is that even at an early time, there is premature and excessive neurogenesis, which we assumed was depleting preferentially a population of cells. And what we found was that indeed this premature neurogenesis reflects the increased asymmetric division of neural crest derived progenitors. And this actually leads to a distinction in the proportions of nociceptive and mechanoreceptive neurons later in development. So there is altered proliferation, not only in the extent of proliferation, but actually in the mode by which cells divide. We've also looked at this in the cerebral cortex, focusing on a population of progenitors called the basal progenitors. These progenitors make the layer two, three projection neurons that actually form the circuits between association cortical regions that are key for cognition. They are, the proliferation in the large cell is, is diminished as is the frequency of layer two, three projection neurons, particularly in association cortices. What we found is that several 22Q11 genes are expressed either in the progenitors themselves, the basal progenitors in the subventricular zone, or there is one, Claudin 5, that's it's expressed in the vasculature that's growing there. And so what we asked was whether or not there's an overall dysregulation of basal progenitor gene expression in the large deletion. We sorted the cells using TBR2, reporter, which marks the basal progenitors. We did a bulk RNA-seq and five pooled biological replicates. First of all, multiple 22Q1 genes are expressed robustly in these cells, and they all diminish by 50%. We found several other target genes um, that regulate cell cycle and adhesion in these basal progenitors. And these are the ones that I'm going to look at. DLK1 is a notch regulator still regulates um, centriole formation for cell division. But I want to draw your attention to three of them. For the reason that 22Q11 deletion, as I've said, targets association cortices, and these cortices are thought to be under or misconnected. Now, I'm going to take a section through, and I'm going to show you where the basal progenitors are throughout the AP extent of the developing cortex. They're pretty uniformly distributed. But when we look at these dysregulated 22 genes that are dysregulated in the basal progenitors selectively by 22Q11 deletion, what we see is that they form a nested AP pattern of subventricular zone, we assume, basal progenitors. So what this suggests is that there is a distinct regional pattern in the SVZ, and somehow 22Q11 deletion is disrupting either quantitatively cells within that pattern that are expressing these genes or disrupting the pattern itself. And we have to find that out. So now I've shown you that there are two stumbles. And what about the third major step we're going to look at? Circuit formation, building the synaptic architecture necessary to mediate these behaviors. Is there a final stumble? Well, the answer is yes. And we looked at this, first of all, for the motor neurons in the brainstem or I'm going to show you the motor neurons that control the movement of the tongue, protruding it and retracting it, which is important for suckling. We're going to look at this in a neonatal brainstem. So I'm showing you um, the circuitry from a neonate. We can label the cells selectively so we can record from the protruders and retractors to look at their rhythmicity. And when we look at the wild type, they have a nice rhythmic firing, these motor neurons that are driving the protrusion of the tongue. And in the large Dell, that firing pattern is slowed down and it's irregular. Now, when we look at the retractors, they have a different rhythmic pattern. And in the large deletion, that rhythm is sped up. And this is actually a very significant difference quantitatively. And the reason is, is that it seems like something's up with the balance of excitation and inhibition. When we look at the GABAergic um, inhibitory postsynaptic currents, they're reduced. When we look at the actual amount of GABA release, presumably by individual synaptic events, the amount of GABA is reduced. This is all significant. And when we look at, this is the normal pattern of GABAergic terminals on hypoglossal motor neurons. You can see those are those big uh, black spots are the motor neurons. You can see that it's quite robust. 
This is the same innervation in the large Dell hypoglossal nucleus. There are fewer terminals, they're smaller, and in EM work that I won't describe the technique of, we found that there's actually diminished GABA content in these individual synapses. So finally, we looked at some of the same questions of circuit development in the cerebral cortex, where during early postnatal development, the dendrites and axons of these layer two, three neurons have to elaborate quite remarkably to make the necessary connections. And what we found was that this relies on mitochondrial function that's mediated by a 22Q11 mitochondrial gene that's selectively expressed in these cells. The synapses go on to develop normally and you have normal cognitive function. And what happens in the large deletion mouse is that the dendrites and axons don't grow, so that particularly in the association cortices, so that you don't have the raw materials to make the synapses. This is because there is an enhanced level of reactive oxygen species that were not cleared from mitochondria. And new evidence that we have says that ATP production in these mitochondria is actually diminished. The synapses that you make are fewer, they have less vesicles, the mitochondria are either disrupted or absent. And these mice, as I've told you, have this cognitive impairment reflecting the circuit that has to be built normally, but that the mitochondrial dysfunction disrupts its construction in the large Dell. And what um, Alejandro Fernandez, Tom Maynard, and Dan Meekin con convinced me to do, I said it'll never work, is we gave the mice a raw scavenger from birth onward, and we restored the layer two, three dendritic differentiation. You're looking at a large Dell 22, uh, large Dell layer two, three projection neuron that looks exactly like its wild type counterparts. And we fixed the synapses both in number and, and their morphological integrity. And even more remarkable is we fixed the cognitive function. So clearly this step of mitochondrial bioenergetic support for specific circuit development steps is again, important and it's impacted by 22Q11 deletion. So what I've shown you is, is that 22Q11 deletion does indeed cause missteps, little stumble here, another stumble there, another stumble there, which leads to a divergent outcome of both neural circuits and behavior that is measurable at least in this 22Q11 deletion, genomically accurate and phenotypically accurate model. So you do trip over multiple steps and there are steps that are rationalizable in terms of what we know about the basic mechanisms of development, how you make a brain developmentally and indeed how you make any organ developmentally. The new challenges I think are to now step back again and ask how is it that subsets, because it's unlikely to be a single gene as several people have said, target each of these developmental steps so that we can figure out where the nodes are that are really critically changed and how that begins to push the system to a divergent and less than optimal outcome. The other thing is, is that we really need to define the circuit dysfunction endpoints because as Tom Sudoff mentioned and others have mentioned, if we know about the last stages of synaptic dysfunction, that may be the best place to intervene at least in the, for behavior to fix the problem. And finally, we need to determine which disruptions are the most amenable to therapeutic intervention, which I think several people have addressed. And I will let you think about what I've had to say to think about um, how that might happen. So with that, I will thank the people in who have done this work. This is the current lab at the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech. We're nestled here in the beautiful Blue Ridge where it's full fall and we look like we're living in a calendar. Um, Tom and Dan have been my constant companions in this journey. And these are the other folks who are now taking it with us. These are all people who've been essential for doing this work. And these are the people who opened their checkbooks and paid for it. So with that, I'll thank you. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Finally, for Donna and for all of us, I want to inter uh, advertise the, the conference this fall in split, Cro uh, summer rather, June, in split Croatia. It looks like that. Who wouldn't want to go? And I hope you can all attend. So thank you, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony, for a wonderful, dynamic uh, presentation.
Um, so uh, now we'll pass to the um, questions. Um, if we have, can we can we gather up our speakers for the, from this last session? Uh, we have Rene, we have Robert. Okay. So um, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know whether people are just going to uh, uh, intervene and ask questions. I'll just start off. If nobody has a burning question, I wanted to um, ask a question to Rene. I'm not quite sure whether he said, and I missed it. But I was just curious to know about the time of the um, organoids that uh, you work on. Um, how long are those organoids developed before you perform the analyses? Yeah, so we, we do time panels, um, but uh, so after a week, you can start analyzing them. Oh, okay. There but it's questions? totally different time scales than you would uh, expect from, from in vivo in, in human development. Right. Uh, Katia. Yeah, I'm, my question is a follow-up to Elizabeth's question. First of all, Rene and all the other speakers, fantastic talk. And specifically also the Organite, when you take your platform from 2D into 3D and you did a, a beautiful single cell analysis, what caught my eye was that not only did you see an upregulation of HLA-DR in 3D, you also had a not insignificant population of DLL4 positive cells. And when I compare this with sort of the amount of DLL4 positive cells we saw on our human fetal single cell data, that was actually comparable because DLL4 is stochastically expressed. So I thought that was an amazing outcome. Now, two questions. Were you able on a protein level to detect PSMB11 in your organoids? And if so, did you already transplant them into the mice? And what did you see? <laughs> Yeah, so we we transplanted precursor cells. I didn't have time to talk about this. So the um, so now pushing the in vitro differentiation in the dish is fairly novel. Um, PSMB11. If you know a good antibody or you have one, send them to us. Happy happy to look. Um, no, we we're also struggling with the antibody. Um, but do you see transcriptionally high then? Now let's backtrack. Um, well, we, I would have to go back. We haven't. We also have human thymus single cell RNA seq, and honestly, we actually haven't compared the levels. Okay. And as you know, levels, unless you do pseudo bulk, are often difficult to interpret due to the zero inflation and dropouts and so on. So, a uh, long story short, we we don't have a one to one comparison. Um, but we, we could do that. I'm not going to look up a slide. I'm, I'm wondering for the PSMB11, not for the DLL4, we do have sorted cells uh, from the FOXM1 GFP reporter on uh, differentiation compared to pediatric thymus. So those data we have, and it's, uh, it's not on par. So it seems we need higher expression. But that's going back to precursor cells. So we now have to do this on our organoid matured cells. So then I can tell you more, which seems Super. to induce the expression levels even more. Yeah. Super, but it was beautiful data and expect an email. <laughs> uh, there's a question from uh, Peter Scambler for Anthony. Uh, any mileage in looking at smaller deletions, Anthony, multi gene back transgenic rescues? Um, yes, we've really wanted to do that. And Bernice made some uh, backs a while ago, um, but we haven't really been able to make much progress on that. We had one smaller deletion that we did look at for some of the phenotypes that actually Tony Winshaw Boris made. And um, we didn't actually recapitulate any of the phenotypes that we'd looked at at that point. So we sort of dismissed those genes, but there was only a handful of them and they were at the five prime end. So, um, I would actually love to do that, particularly because we have a much denser sense of the developmental mechanisms that are disrupted. And I think going back and remapping them, because we also have good assays to at least give us an initial in indication of what might be going on, that that would be a great idea. So if anybody has those back lines, please let me know. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if Bernice has them anymore. <laughs> 
or there are our new ones? No, but... I got rid of them. <laughs> oh, I mean, no. You can only, I th although I, I think that it's possible the TPX1 back is somewhere like in some kind of like MMRC or something like that. Um, because I know we put many years into it, but the other ones didn't have phenotypes. So we didn't, unfortunately, you know, with money limited and et cetera, you can't save these things. And yeah, I, I, I understand. The repository but... issue is limiting. Yeah, of course. Uh, Robert, you have a question for? Yeah, a, a quick question for Anthony. I was, I was wondering if your RAN BP1 mutant that you talked about, does that impact on heart development? Um, yes, it does. We haven't really looked at that as much. We've looked at craniofacial development and at muscle development. And there is a story there that Tom is putting is finishing putting the finishing touches on. So I won't steal his thunder. But um, the heart is disrupted. I mean, the, um, the 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 homozygotes die right at birth. So we usually collect them at at um, E19, and we should probably look in more detail. We haven't. I and mean, the one thing that's really interesting is, is that, you know, there are distinctions in the um, valence of retinoid signaling in the heart and in the hindbrain, for example, and in the forebrain. I mean, in the heart, um, Tom and I showed a long time ago that, you know, the heart is actually um, hypersensitive to teratogenesis by retinoids in the large Dell background. And, you know, we sort of looked at that genetically and pharmacologically, but in converse, um, actually lowering retinoid signaling makes the brainstem better. So there's clearly a lot of differential signaling depending on the tissue context. And I think one thing that's really interesting from what you talked about is this relationship of the of the cranial mesoderm that gives rise to the pharyngeal muscles and the muscles of facial expression, even for thinking about what goes wrong with the biomechanical apparatus for suckling, feeding, and swallowing, and how that might influence further the misconnectivity of the cranial circuit. So it's a great question, but we don't have a full answer. Cool. Thank, thank, thanks, Anthony. To be continued in Croatia, Anthony. Uh, I can ask a, a quick question to Robert then, so always on the, the um, subject of the retinoic acid signaling, you know, how, how dependent do you think uh, the, the patterning of the uh, endoderm with the, the anterior um, secondary heart field, I mean, the anterior domain, the TBX1 expressing the posterior domain, uh, TBX five expressing um, how much of this is determined by retinoic acid signaling and which are the cells that um, are producing re retinoic acid in these periods of development yeah that's 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 really where we'd like to go I mean we think that, that it's been produced by the mesoderm but whether that's whether it's acting directly on the posterior mesoderm to activate tpx5 uh, you know whether it directly is unknown or via another cell type, for example, adjacent endoderm. There are retinoic acid responsive enhancers at TPX5, but they're important in, in limb development. And when they made transgenics with those enhancers, they didn't see this cardiac expression domain. So, so it's, still, it's still a mystery as to exactly how retinoic acid, it's certainly leading to upregulation of TPX5 in, the, in this posterior part of the epithelium, but it may be indirect. Okay. And Robert, I mean, just a quick question. I mean, does it actually also, it, are any of the um, sort of the catabolic enzymes dysregulated so that they're not actually opposing the retinoid signaling in the way that they should or shaping it locally as they should? So, so they're, they're, they're more expressed in the anterior part of the epithelium. And in fact, when, we, mm -hmm. when, when Christopher, who's now in Bernice's lab, did, did these experiments, we also tried adding retinoic acid in, in embryo culture to see if we could expand the, the domain of this posterior domain. And that, that doesn't happen. And we think that's because mm. of these catabolic enzymes being expressed mm -hmm. in the anterior part of the epithelium. And they're not sensitive to the dysregulation via TBX1. Um, so that's in the context of blocking retinoic acid signaling. Right. Um, but they, but they, are, they're, 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 they are downstream of TBX1, okay. uh, yes, like you showed, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, if there are there other questions from the audience, we still have a good number of participants. Uh, if there, but if there are no other questions, then I'll hand over to Katya, who uh, would, is going to say a few words uh, to sum up. Yes, of, of goodbye and of keeping us together. So first of all, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this session was fantastic. All of those were. Thank you to um, the moderators, the fantastic speakers. Thank you to Rachel, who has organized this impeccably. And Rachel, I can only imagine what an in-person uh, symposium would have looked like. And I'm already thank you. I think that may not be for us. That was in another language. It's, it's, it's a pasta <laughs> recipe. Don't worry about it. Okay, I keep talking and maybe maybe <laughs> Ken from IT. Yes. Okay. Um, but thank you, Maria Grazia. It was really her vision um, who started our immunology program. And therefore also uh, last, but of course not least, but foremost, thank you to Candice, you thanks to Hamilton. Without her generosity, um, most of this research um, at Stanford, but also beyond in Europe and at other parts in the US would not have happened. So uh, Candice, thank you so, so much. Um, uh, at the very end, I would like to channel our program director, um, George Hollander, who always says, you know, this is not just a symposium where we come together and have a good time, but this is a symposium to connect us and this is where the work starts and this symposium is just the beginning to foster interdisciplinary discourse, collaboration and really a sharing of tools and ideas that we have developed. And so to keep momentum going, we have envisioned a quarterly seminar series that is open to everybody in which we also envision that participants can show their screen and um, actively participate. And this uh, seminar series will happen uh, every three months. There will be a champion. The first champion is Alex. I'm not sure if he's, uh, yes, I still see him here. And um, it will be on segmental duplications. The next uh, seminar will be championed by our immunology group, and it will be a deep dive into the immunology featuring uh, Kate Sullivan, uh, John Sleesman, uh, who uh, is the division chief at Duke and will speak on thymic transplantation, as well as Andrew Jennery from Newcastle, who will tell us that uh, bone marrow transplantation for 22Q11 does not work so well. And, and then uh, continued sessions will follow on neuroscience. And um, all of this really, um, with this single goal in mind to make the lives of children and adults with 22Q11 deletion syndrome better. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude the symposium. Thank very, very much all the participants. And uh, we hope to see you at the seminar series again. And of course, in split. So with that, I say goodbye. Bye-bye.